So welcome back. We're ready for our second session today, Atlantic Corridors in the Global Economy. Uh, very distinguished uh, set of panelists, and we've asked our good friend Bruce Stokes, who's now the director of the Pew Global Attitudes Project, to be the moderator. So Bruce, take it away. Craig, thank you very much. It is a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Uh, what Craig uh, uh, neglected to say is I'm also a non-resident fellow at the GMF and very uh, happy to have had a long association here with GMF and uh, with uh, a variety of programs the GMF has done like this. And I think you're in for a, a great discussion. I know we've had a, a great interaction to date. Um, as you know, our topic, as Craig said, is the Atlantic corridors and the global economy. Um, the reality is corridors can be transmission belts for growth or they can be vectors for economic malaise, uh, especially in these troubled times. Uh, and obviously our challenge is to try to use these corridors of, of trade and investment as a way to overcome the, some of the slowdowns in at least some parts of the Atlantic uh, area. Um, we assume that uh, we're here, in fact, because we assume the Atlantic uh, is or can be a trade and investment uh, corridor for growth. Uh, but the reality is all of us have other options. Um, uh, geography is not destiny in the economy, especially in a global economy. Uh, uh, China is now Brazil's largest trading partner. Who would have thought that 20 years ago? Um, the U.S. has major trade ties with China, uh, Japan, South Korea, across the uh, North Pacific uh, corridor. Uh, Europe uh, has a potential for a huge corridor with Russia uh, over time. Um, so we have corridors that pull us apart as well as these potential of corridors that, uh, that pull us together. Um, uh, the current corridors in the Atlantic space are both working and not working. Uh, the U.S.-EU uh, uh, trade corridor, trade is actually up 3.5% across the, uh, between the European Union and the United States in the first seven months of this year, despite the economic slowdown in Europe. Thank you very much. That's very good for us Americans. And also, I would argue, very good for Europeans. Um, U.S.-Brazilian trade is up 7.8% in the first seven months of this year. Again, uh, to our Brazilian friends, we in America, thank you. Uh, your growth is helping uh, keep our economy going. Um, uh, U.S. Uh, Mercosur trade is up 14%, uh, again, uh, in large part because of Brazil's dynamism. Uh, and that's certainly a help for uh, the European Union. But U.S. African trade is down 22% uh, in the first seven months of this year, largely because uh, energy uh, trade is down between the U.S. and Europe, uh, and, uh, Euro the U.S. and Africa. And uh, let me tell you, if the projections of U.S. of growing U.S. domestic oil and gas production are, are uh, accurate, um, African trade with the United States is in trouble. And that corridor has to be uh, enhanced because we cannot uh, depend on it being driven by energy uh, trade. Um, we all have options, as I said, uh, some of which may be more attractive than the Atlantic option today. Um, it, the good thing is uh, we don't have to choose. We are going to pursue all corridors of trade and investment going forward. Uh, but we... Um, I do have constraints in terms of our bureaucratic bandwidth, in terms of our political bandwidth. Uh, we can't do all things at all times. Um, so uh, do we choose, at the margin, to invest more of these energies in the Atlantic corridors, or do we uh, invest them in other uh, corridors of trade and investment that uh, they are also attractive? Um, and the the question really is whether the Atlantic quarters offer sufficient potential to merit that kind of investment, and I think that's one of the things we need to talk about here, as well as what are some of the, uh, of the obstacles. We have a very uh, distinguished panel uh, uh, with us today. I'll just briefly introduce them. You have uh, in your, your uh, booklets uh, more extensive biographies. To uh, my extreme right, we have Alejandro Yara, who is the Deputy Director General of the WTO, a former uh, senior Chilean diplomat and trade negotiator, uh, 
uh, for many years, involved in many of uh, Chile's uh, major trade negotiations. Uh, next to him, we have Leonardo Martinez Diaz, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Treasury for Western Hemisphere. Uh, we were joking before, 20 years ago, uh, there was no Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Western Hemisphere. So that's a sign of how important this region has become uh, in the U.S. Treasury over time. Uh, he, prior to taking this position, he was the Director of Policy at AID, at the Agency for International Development in the United States and was the deputy director of uh, the Global Economy Program at the Brookings Institution. Uh, next to him is Vital Moreira, who is the chairman of the International Trade Committee of the European Parliament. For those of you who are not familiar with some of the recent developments with the European Parliament, the European Parliament has a hugely important new role in, on, in trade negotiations going forward, not unlike that of the U.S. Congress. Uh, so uh, for good or for ill, for those of you who have had to deal with the U.S. Congress on trade, uh, the European Parliament is going to be a player going forward on a whole range of trade issues. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Moreira has, has been a professor of law. Uh, in his uh, uh, home country of Portugal, and also a member of the Portuguese Constitutional Court. Uh, and next to him is Jean-Michel Severino, who is the CEO of Investisseurs et Partenaires, who uh, specialize in venture capital for small and medium-sized companies uh, and for micro-enterprises um, in Africa. He was, for a decade, the CEO of the French International Development Agency, and before that, a senior official at uh, the World Bank. Uh, to start this off, I'd like to ask each of the panelists a, a question or so, and then we'll, we'll involve the audience in a, in a broader discussion. Uh, Alejandro, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, uh, I know this is not official policy uh, in, in Geneva, so I'm going to say it so you don't have to say it. The Doha Round is dead. Uh, that is basically, I think, the operating assumption of most governments and certainly most trade experts that I meet around the world. Uh, so the question really is, rather than to re-debate the Doha round, the question really is, um, does multilateralism uh, have something to offer to the Atlantic corridors in terms of uh, a multilateral approach to um, enhancing trade and investment in the region? Uh, is it through services? Is it through dispute settlement? Uh, what role do you see multilateralism play, uh, certainly in the, in the short to medium term? Thank you. Thank you, Bruce, uh, very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say when you say that the Doha round is dead, that's half true because it's deadlocked, which is <laughs> just different. Um, Secondly, when you introduce and said to my extreme right, I hope that's not a political statement. <laughs> anyway. um, thirdly, I, in thinking about the multilateralism, thinking about re Atlantic corridors and so on, I think we have countries in this part of the world, particularly the South Atlantic, who exhibit much better economic performance, much better social policy. Uh, in Latin America, some of them, and, and certainly in Africa, etc. So we have eradication of poverty, less inequality, you have a, a better basis on which to uh, be more active internationally and try to, to do better international cooperation. I don't think that there is uh, much that can be done unless you tackle some specific issues uh, multilaterally, because that's the only place where you can tackle them. For example, you cannot do away with the dis distortions on agriculture unless you do a multilateral deal, because this is a collective disarmament to produce uh, elimination of trade distorting subsidies. Secondly, the only way I think that can be done in an effective manner tackle the crisis that we have with fisheries, mainly due to the subsidies the governments, some governments use, is through multilateral multilateral deal, that means the WTO, and so on. So there are many aspects of this equation which I, th I think that require, by definition, a multilateral uh, action. There are other spheres in which that you can pursue regional, sub-regional cooperation, and you can use the Atlantic to do that, including on, on fisheries and maybe on transportation. Uh, let's not forget the Panama Canal is expanding. That opens even more opportunities. And lowers the cost on energy and on food security. But 
to go beyond this lose sort of a cooperation, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult because at the same time, the region exhibits the South Atlantic at least, some rigidities in terms of how they um, interact with the rest of the world. Mercosur pretends to be a customs union. It's a rather imperfect one, like many other customs unions in the world. They are still segmented markets. The reality of economic integration in Africa, the jury still out there, trying to move to do with difficulties and in, in formats which are not always that flexible. As Carlos Portales pointed out yesterday, the only ones who have done really something effective with the United States or with, with, with Europe, for example, and others are countries in, in, in the Pacific. So this leads to questions and issues uh, of, of this nature, which I think pose roadblocks and that make it difficult to go into a deeper forms of international cooperation unless you adopt forms of uh, international, let's say, uh, action cooperation, which would be much more flexible. Great, thank you. I think we'll, we'll follow up on some of those roadblocks because I think that clearly the politics of this is, is, is terribly important. Leonardo, um, I think it's fair to say that the U.S. has a mixed record in dealing with the corridors uh, in the at at Atlantic. Um, clearly, we have NAFTA, which is uh, uh, one of our uh, most important regional arrangements. We have a free trade agreement with Morocco, uh, which, as we heard last night, the Moroccans think is working very well. Um, by the same token, uh, in the region you're most worried about, and the Bush administration made a huge effort to create a free trade area of the Americas, but because of differences between Brazil and, and Washington, we were not able to, to uh, resolve that and, and create a free trade area of the Americas. Um, we have a GOA, which is our uh, trade uh, relationship with a number of African countries, has actually spurred a lot of trade, uh, but I think it would be safe to say is still inadequate to the need in terms of, of stimulating uh, uh, commerce between uh, the, the region. Um, and we also have this looming potential US-EU free trade agreement, which obviously doesn't involve the southern Atlantic, but conceivably has an in, uh, reverberates. Uh, so I'd be curious to get your sense of, of how you see this all moving forward. Do we, do we ever stitch all these together? Do we continue to do hub and spoke kind of arrangements? Um, what's your sense of that? Sure, and first of all, thank you for, for the invitation to the organizers for, for being here. Uh, let me try to get at your question by focusing on two Atlantic corridors. One of those is that which connects Latin America and the Caribbean on one hand and Europe and the other is that between Latin America and the Caribbean and the United States. Uh, I think um, in order to answer your question, you have to think about what is going on today, uh, put it in context. You know, first of all, I don't think we've talked about this enough, the connections between Latin America and Europe are actually very deep and very strong, in some ways stronger than they are with China. So for example, if you look at the trade relationship between Latin America and Europe, and by Europe I'm going to talk about the Eurozone in particular, you have $110 billion in exports from Latin America going to the Eurozone every year. That's almost 40% more than Latin America exports to China, even though we hear lots about commodity trade and so on. Uh, FDI, you know, Europeans have been investing in Latin America for a long time. They represent about 40% of all FDI flowing into Latin America. So clearly very important connections there. Now, as we have talked about, Europe is going through some significant fiscal and financial challenges. Now, we in the U.S. Uh, have all the confidence that Europe will be able to confront and overcome these challenges. Uh, and in fact, over the last few months, they have uh, taken very important steps to address uh, those challenges. But even in a good scenario, it's going to take some time. And Europe is going to be growing slower than we would all like it to be. You know, the IMF uh, is projecting that next year the uh, European, uh, the Eurozone will be growing at, uh, will be contracting actually by 0.3% uh, this year, and then next year uh, will probably grow by about 0.7%. So it's a lot lower growth than we would like. Now that is going to affect Latin America. There's no question about that. We've done some analysis uh, internally, and uh, you know, many of the countries in the region, even some of the bigger economies like Brazil, Argentina, Peru, uh, are very actually closely connected. Their growth is very correlated with that of Europe. And so as Europe slows, that will inevitably affect uh, Latin America in a couple of ways. One is the trade channel. 
you know, some countries, uh, including Brazil, uh, Peru, even smaller ones like uh, Jamaica and Costa Rica, export uh, almost a fifth of all of their exports to Europe. Uh, and inevitably, as Europe is able to uh, import less, uh, consumption will decline for, uh, exports will decline for uh, Latin American economies. And of course, as uh, Europe goes through uh, some deceleration, there will be less profits, less revenues to invest in Latin America. Uh, and that is obviously a concern for, for all of us. Now let me turn briefly to the other channel, the other um, uh, corridor, which is US Latin America. And I believe that channel, that corridor, will be a source of significant strength for Latin America during this sensitive time through when Europe is, is going through its challenges. And in fact, it may become more important than it is today. Uh, you know, today, um, the US absorbs 40% of all of Latin America's exports. Uh, our uh, commercial and investment relations are extremely, extremely strong, in many ways more important than those with, uh, with China. And, uh, and I think for many countries in Latin America, the US will be an incredible source of opportunities, uh, not just in terms of trade, uh, but also in terms of the composition of the trade. So take Brazil, for example. Almost 90% of what Brazil exports to China is commodities, most of that soybeans and iron ore. But half of what Brazil exports to the US is actually manufactured goods, regional aircraft, auto parts, cell phones, right? Uh, and so if Brazil and other countries in the region want to export not just more, but also higher value added goods, the kinds that generate uh, good jobs and increase value added, uh, then the U.S. becomes a really important strategic opportunity. And I think this has not been lost on many of our partners in, in the hemisphere. And, uh, of course, the U.S. will also remain a key source of capital for Latin America. Uh, already, we, the U.S. historically has accounted for about 23% of all FDI in Latin America. And in the future, there's many reasons to believe that will remain the same. So as Europe recovers, as Europe does the needful in order to manage its challenges, I think the U.S. Uh, Latin America quarter will become uh, even more important than it has been in the past. Thank you, and I think that does underscore that in this time of crisis, uh, there are opportunities here to offset some of the pain uh, if we can make these corridors work better, in essence, and, and remove some of the barriers. Uh, Professor Morari, the EU has uh, a free trade agreement with Mexico. Uh, you're negotiating one with Canada. Um, there's, a, I think, a strong potential that one may be launched with the United States in, in December. Um, you have a series of agreements with Africa. I would say, to be kind, the assessment of those is not terribly great in terms of their... I, I know the Europeans are very proud of them, but I, the Africans, I think, would like them to see be more uh, uh, fruitful for them. And if, by my count, we're in the ninth... We've had nine rounds of EU-Mercosur negotiations in terms of an association agreement. And so there's some question or doubts beginning to raise as to whether this thing will ever get done. Um, what do you see as the prospects for enhancing trade and investment in the Atlantic region for, for Europe? And, and, and maybe more importantly, what do you think are some of the bumps in the road that we should all be aware of that are coming up? <coughs> Well, uh, first of all, uh, good morning to you all. I'm very pleased to be here, participating in this discussion, discussion aimed at uh, uh, debating and helping to create the notion of a wider Atlantic uh, political and economic space. To complete the picture that you have g given about the trade uh, negotiations uh, between the EU and the Atlantic partners, let me say that we have concluded recently agreements with Colombia and Peru, with Central America. The agreement with uh, uh, the Caribbean is already in place for two years now. We are negotiating with uh, Canada. We uh, could be launching, launching negotiations with the United States in the near future. We are negotiating with Mercosur. We have been uh, negotiating uh, economic partnership agreements with all the African regions. We have uh, agreements with uh, Morocco and the Mediterranean uh, Africa, and uh, we have decided recently to launch uh, negotiations for a deep and comprehensive trade agreement with Morocco. So we are negotiating with all the neighboring countries of the uh, wide Atlantic uh, uh, rim. This means that if there is someone uh, 
aiming at creating a real wide Atlantic trade area marketplace. This is the union to be credit for. And I think this is very important because in Europe, uh, in the European Union, as you have uh, said when introducing myself, the European Parliament has a very strong role in trade policy. So, and that, there are some key issues we agree with the other institutions of the Union, namely the European Commission, which is the executive body, and the Council, which is so-called the, the sort of federal representation of member states of the Union. This is first, trade is key for the European Union. We cannot live without trade. And uh, you have already mentioned that although notwithstanding the crisis in Europe, trade is on the upside. We are increasing our trade with almost our partners, notwithstanding the crisis and the lack of growth in Europe. Secondly, the Atlantic is our ocean. We have no choice. The United States have, uh, may have a choice between the Atlantic and Pacific. We don't. The Atlantic is the only ocean we've, uh, we have got. Uh, thirdly, we believe that we need to have a wider approach to the Atlantic trade than the north, uh, upper north Atlantic, that means between the EU and the United States. I have here a small uh, drawing about the uh, Atlantic pool. Here you have North, Atlantic, North America, here the Central and South America, Europe and Africa. And these are the main avenues of trade between these four areas. You'll notice that between the United States and the European Union, there is a very thick, uh, a, a very thick uh, uh, channel of trade, uh, not only trade in goods, services, but also investment. Uh, people, uh, 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 university professors, university students, many students, and so forth. Then the shape of the arrows between uh, Europe and Africa is very strong. Africa is our third uh, importer, third <coughs> exporter, and our uh, fourth importer. Also, our relationship with uh, uh, Latin America is, is very good. Uh, the United States have very good relations, not only with us, but also with uh, uh, Latin America. Uh, we are um, not as thick relations with Africa, what is missing here is we have a quadrangle, but uh, 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 one side is missing. This is the South-South relationship. So in order to complete the, the uh, wider Atlantic marketplace, we need to fill in this, uh, this line, this bridge between Africa and, uh, and Latin America. Uh, some progress is being made. The union is there just through our uh, privileged relations with Africa and Latin America, but still it's up to them to, be, to, to, to bridge in this, this gap, uh, this South Atlantic gap. And I think that in order to have a wider uh, Atlantic uh, political relation, we need to have a real wider Atlantic market uh, place. That's why we are so engaged we at the European Parliament, the European Council and the European Commission in just trying to create this new concept of a wider Atlantic marketplace. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jean-Michel, um, we all know, or we should know, that, that foreign direct investment is the driver of trade. Um, we all are aware, or at least we've read, about the massive Chinese investment coming into Africa. Uh, but these are huge mega projects. Uh, you spend your days now trying to get money to the small and medium-sized companies, the microfinance organizations, that at least we think, based on experience in, in Europe and the United States, can be real sources of job creation and, and, and dynam dynamic uh, growth. What are the obstacles to doing that? Um, and as a corollary to that as well, how do we make sure that whatever foreign direct investment there is, especially in Africa, um, is more sensitive to the environmental impact, to the social impact of investment than possibly some investment in other parts of the world has been in the past. <clears throat> okay, good morning, everybody. I'm also a GMF fellow, and uh, that's why it's so exciting this morning and yesterday to uh, be there and to see how GMF is shaping a new and a very different, different way, a different vision at Atlantic Ties. 
Um, I think it's very important to restate, uh, in order to answer precisely your question, uh, that Africa is changing to a point that is very difficult to imagine under, unless you experience it in a daily life. The African economy has grown on average uh, 5% in the past 15 years. If you project that numbers, it means that within 30 years, the African economy will be about the size of the current Chinese economy, right? It will have grown from the turning of the century, the size of the Belgium economy, to the size of the Chinese economy. It's an incredible change that is boosted also by the incredible demographic rise that's happening and that will lead Africa to host about 1.8 billion people by 2050. The most incredible demographic transformation the world has ever experienced. Now, what is interesting also to say is that this growth is not only or maybe mainly about commodity prices, as it is often said. It is also because Africa is building its own domestic market because of the demographic trends, demographic dividend, the huge and very fast uh, uh, transformation of the demographic structure. It's because also uh, of the changes in economic policies, etc. As a consequence, uh, one very important thing that you will see is not only the need for huge job creation to answer the demand of the young people that we were discussing uh, in the previous session, but also the incredible energy and capacity to create that is being demonstrated every day. Actually, you see an entrepreneurial transformation in Africa that you, know, you see a new and incredibly active generation of entrepreneurs across Africa, from Francophone to Anglophone to Lusophone, etc. And the bulk of it is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. Let's remember, for instance, and uh, I will very now try to answer exactly your question, that this year, South Africa is going to have a sheer 1% or 2% growth. Unfortunately, the Northern Africa will also grow very slowly because of the political uh, problems it's facing. Now, Sub-Saharan Africa will experience 7% growth, so larger than the average Asian growth. And this is mainly due with inland locked countries with no commodity, commodity uh, exports, or very low commodity exports. So the domestic market is leading the transformation. This movement has, you know, been largely unnoticed by business communities in the past 10 years. Uh, it has been more commented by academics, development experts, and so forth. The, but if you look at who have been the major business partners of that transformation, it has been, of course, China, because of its huge uh, uh, extractive industries, investments, and its commodity uh, exports, but also the new South-South players, India, Brazil, which has been a very active investor in the past, uh, in past years. Europe completely locked and stuck in its formal relationship with Africa, carrying the debt burden of the structural adjustment period, has been absolutely unable to be part of the game and is really completely out of it. But if you look at the capital, it's coming and the private equity capital that has risen tremendously about five times in the past five years. It has nearly entirely come from Northern America, especially the United States of America, which is now the largest private equity player. Now, if you look at this private equity, it's going mainly into South Africa, which is fair, but only a very short, very small portion of Africa and not the most dynamic one, and it will remain so for many years. Uh, and it's very much in infrastructure uh, or very large corporations. The missing point is this uh, huge uh, sector of small and medium corporations, which, is, which has to be because, after all, Africa has no industry. It has no domestic market, and it's building its domestic market now. And as you would expect, it's, being it, it's building it from the bottom. From the bottom. Now, it's, investing there is probably one of the most profitable things that you can do because the rates of returns and the speed of growth are just incredible. They are, I mean, the, among the highest in the world. But it's also uh, the most, I mean, socially, the most useful. 
with, when I remember, when I look, for instance, at the 10 million first million euros that we invested about 10 years ago in Africa, those very little 10 million uh, euros, our first investments, they created about 2,000 jobs. So it's very hard to find uh, uh, a, a job creation to money ratio which is higher than that. Now, the main obstacle for going ahead and moving is just money, because the entrepreneurs, they are there, the policy environment has improved tremendously. Of course, you have corruption, of course, you have infrastructure gaps, etc. But in general, entrepreneurs manage to get around those problems. But may, roughly speaking, money is not flowing enough into the direction. Basically, because once more, this tremendous structural change has gotten largely unnoticed from many. Great. Thank you. Uh, just as an anecdote to follow up on that observation, I remember a couple of years ago asking the head of the American Electronics Association uh, where his CEOs thought they would be building electronics in 20 years. And without hesitation, he said Africa. And I disagreed and said there's corruption and there's no infrastructure and there's no trained workforce. And he said, yeah, yeah, you're describing China in the 1940s. And, and so I think whether that's accurate or not in terms of what will be happening in Africa in the years ahead, you're beginning to see, I think, as you noted, a, a great deal of interest by corporates in, in moving uh, things to Africa. It's, it's going to be a, a, a huge challenge. And the question is, how do we all uh, benefit from this growth and, 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 and mutually benefit? Um, I could go on asking questions all day, but that's not my role. My role is to facilitate a discussion with the audience here. So if someone can hand me a mic, I would like to begin to call on people uh, from the audience. Uh, if you could, I'm going to group the questions, get two or three questions. Uh, try to address your question to an individual on the panel so the panel does not feel like they, everyone in the panel has to answer every question. Um, uh, even if you have a statement to make, phrase it as a question, uh, <laughs> try to keep it short. And um, uh, I warn you, if you don't ask tough questions, uh, you'll force me to start asking tough questions of our panel. So uh, with that in mind, let's, 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 uh, let's start here. Right here is the first. Uh, and if you could identify yourself, please. Thanks. My name is Elias Links, and I'm from the tip of Africa, southernmost tip. South Africa, and uh, I've been involved with some trade negotiations with the European Union way back for South Africa's FTA. Um, so I would like to pose a question to the WTO representative here. Uh, given all that was said here about the corridors and the development of regional uh, alliances and trade agreements, the question inevitably comes, to what extent does the WTO still have a role in the multilateral sphere? Uh, they've been overtaken by the big members of the WTO to do their own thing, kind of, be that in South America, be that in Africa. So is there a role for, for that type of thing? Uh, I'd like to concur with the last speaker in terms of the very potent growth potential of uh, Africa. Uh, the one thing that we have uh, recently discovered is more and more and more gas and oil on the eastern part of the continent. And that in itself will make investment possibilities even greater. So I would like to, to pose that to the Okay, uh, hold that thought. We'll get another c question or two over here. I saw someone. No? Where? Yes, over there. Thank you. My name is Olainka Kretin Randall. I'm from Sierra Leone on the west coast of Africa. It's not really a question, it's more of a comment. Um, the last speaker started to unpack it a little bit, but I just wanted to comment that. Um, yesterday evening and this morning, we've been talking about Africa, Africa, and I think I'd just like to, it, it may be stating the, the obvious, but Africa is such a diverse, complex continent, and 
it's sounding slightly simplistic when we talk about um, Africa. As I say, I may be stating the um, obvious, but just to say that, for example, we can't really compare Sierra Leone with South Africa. We'd probably compare South Africa with somewhere on the North Atlantic. Well, I mean, as I say, it's just so diverse and c complex, and I just wanted to state that. Great, great point. I think we can, we can get a response from our audience. Uh, one more question here. Thank you, Jennifer Hillman from the German Marshall Fund. I guess two questions. One, if you think about the trade patterns or the way trade negotiations have often been characterized, both at the WTO and in general, the Atlantic uh, discussions, they tended to have been divided into developed versus developing countries. Indeed, some would say part of the failure to end Doha was because the Brazils, the Indias, the Chinas of the world tended to be grouped together and considered developing countries uh, with a lot of other much lesser uh, economic uh, growth engines, and that, that it was that divide. And I'm just curious whether, as you see things moving forward, um, in terms of any Atlantic trade relationships, whether you see that breaking down and how that breaking down of these blocks of develop versus, versus developing would come about. And a second question quickly would be, how do you see the Atlantic situation addressing what others would refer to as the more 21st century trade issues? We've had a lot of discussion about goods and services and tariffs and the sort of traditional trade things. How do you see any new agreements addressing everything from currency to corruption to competition policy, cybersecurity, some of the more new trade issues? How do they come into any new Atlantic arrangements? Alejandro, why don't we start with, with you. Uh, at, I noticed, to elaborate on that question about the role of the WTO, uh, it is multilateralism have a, a future really in this region, what can you contribute? When I mentioned that the US and the EU might launch a free trade agreement, I noticed your eyes ri rise a bit. Now, this has been, until recently, um, anathema to multilateralists, that the two biggest economies in the world would get themselves together and do a regional agreement. Um, it does seem to me that that may be inevitable, but I'm curious to get your sense of, of the, how the WTO deals with this growing regionalism, um, how does one make sure that the regionalism enhances the multilateral system? Sure, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, a good starting point is to say, if you can't beat them, join them. I think that's <laughs> simple. But let me take, for example, EU, United States. Let me say the formidable things these two giants would have to face if they do a negotiation. First of all, the different standards for many products. Where one, these are almost cultural um, reflections of their own societal preference. So they one wants to impose on the other. They should get moving to some mutual recognition, but this poses many problems. Secondly, an issue which is very difficult to move unless you do it multilaterally, agriculture. Reform in agriculture, and this I think would be absolutely necessary to get an agreement between the United States and the EU. And third, other sectors which pose tremendous difficulties. For example, one side speaks of audiovisuals, and the other side, usually with French accent or Italian, they would say, these are cultural industries, untouchable. Anyway, uh, so you have many issues which are, you know, very, so I have my, my, my doubts whether this will be feasible in a reasonable period of time. Now, second point, most of the liberalization in developing countries over the last 25 years has been unilateral, most of it about 65% of it or something like that. Huh? Uh, a little bit has been multilateral, which is Uruguay round plus successions, and 10% of it has been due to free trade agreements. It shows that the bulk of the countries are moving in the right direction in terms of liberalization. We have more free trade agreements and I think we'll have more and more bilateral, plurilateral, because it's a struggle against discrimination. If a Chilean exporter sees that in Mercosur their tariffs go down, they tell the government go out and do a free trade agreement with the Mercosur. If, the, if Europe sees, as they did, see the United States moving with Korea, they have to move in as well, and they did. 
because you don't want to be discriminated in the market. So I expect this to be more and more the case if you get more liberalization and bigger markets involved through free trade agreements. So I'm not surprised with that. The risk of that is that we are building up regulatory frameworks which might make difficult the day of tomorrow to produce convergence. And the role of the multilateral system is not only to, to control this in terms of review and examining the impact, etc., but also to liberalize for those outliers who are not participating in this festival of free trade agreements. But again, as I said in the beginning, to tackle the most intractable issues, which to this day can only be done multilaterally, agriculture subsidization. Fisheries, anti-dumping are three that come to my mind, right? But there are several others. And also, there's a thing which I think goes to answer Jennifer's point about the North-South. The world is very different from what it was 11 years ago. Uh, today, more is required from the larger emerging countries in terms of concessions to bring about a deal. But what I think is also interesting is that many developing countries, so-called today, position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, saying, forget about all this North-South, forget about preferential treatment, we want reciprocity. This is the way, for example, most of the countries in Latin America have positioned themselves in terms of their trade relations, and I'm talking trade not only goods, but services, investment. They've done free trade agreement with the Euro, with North America, amongst themselves, and so on. They are doing reciprocity. Other countries have a different strategy. Fine. This poses a problem, but it's a situation which is changing very quickly uh, in terms of how you conduct the, the trade relations in the world. Jean-Michel, um, the, the, the comment, really, but I'll, I'll rephrase it as a question. I mean, Africa is clearly a very diverse place, uh, growing very rapidly, which is good, but very diverse. And as one of the speakers earlier has mentioned, um, trade relations among or between these diverse African countries are possibly not what one would hope for or wish for. In other words, still a lot of barriers, a lot of obstacles. Um, do you anticipate, and this is going to come off as a little bit pejorative, but I, I mean it so to be provocative, that Africa can get its act together enough to speak with more of a single voice with the other parts of the region, because if they don't, there's always the danger that the Brazils or the Americas or the, or the European, Europe's of the world will pick them off and, and will get arrangements that may not be as collectively useful for Africa. Yeah, first, the lady's comment was perfectly accurate. Uh, Africa is very diverse in terms of geography, in terms of economic performance, in terms of structures of its economy, in terms of culture, etc., etc. So, and, you know, of course, it, will take two, it, it, it would take us uh, hours to, to fine tune and, and to really yeah. uh, go into uh, uh, the reality of what's happening there. Now, Africa is uh, unfortunately uh, scattered in a large number of countries, and it will be very difficult for it to uh, be politically united and to have economic policies at the level of the continent. It's why it's likely this continent, despite its growing importance in the world economy, will remain politically less influent than, for instance, China or India or large uh, single uh, e e economies. This being said, uh, there is a, a very important movement of intra-trade which is also going unnoticed. If you look, for instance, at the very recent numbers that have been put by uh, OECD and, and the uh, uh, African Development Bank, intra-African trade has grown from about 5% at the beginning of the century, so virtually nothing, to about 25% of uh, its uh, exports and imports, which is a big change. And it's uh, related, of course, to the, uh, to the large number of landlocked countries that have to uh, trade and through the harbors, uh, et cetera, with the rest of the world. But it's also due to the, to the complementarity of the economies based on the different uh, weather regimes uh, and the different uh, levels of, of uh, economic development. Uh, and as a consequence, and this is at the same partially the result of the economic integration, which is taking place within uh, regional unions, 
uh, ECOWAS, uh, SADEC, uh, Eastern African uh, Community, uh, but is also uh, the, uh, those uh, regional uh, integration uh, structures are also boosted and strengthened by the level of growing intertrade that's happening. And one political and economic assumption that you could make is that rather than the UA, probably those regional unions are going to play a greater and greater political and technical role in the future of, uh, the, of African economic development because they are more the size of the economy. One single number, if you look at uh, ECOWAS, ECOWAS is going probably to host in the next 20 years something like 500 or 600 million people, okay? It's a big number of people. The economic, uh, the Eastern Economic Union, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, etc., is going also to host about 500 million people. So th these are already very large number of people and different situations that have to be handled at the closer level, probably than at the level of the continent. So let's not bet too much on the uh, African Union, maybe, for very structural reason, I mean, uh, but let's look at what's going to happen at the regional level in Africa, and we'll probably be surprised. So that's a very helpful sign. I Leonardo, I'm, I'm going to ask you, and I'll put you on the spot a bit. Uh, we don't have a Brazilian on the, on the panel, but I want to take off on, on Jennifer's question about the the BRICS and specifically the, the B of the BRICS, Brazil, because that's the, 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 the country among the BRICS that is, is in, the, in the Atlantic uh, uh, region. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, in the past, uh, Washington has been uh, very frustrated with Brazil. Uh, uh, it was the perception of the Americans, rightly or wrongly, I'm sure the Brazilians would disagree, that it was the Brazilians that blocked the FTAA from, from happening. There was frustration in the Bush administration with the Brazilian role in the Doha round. Uh, that's water over the dam, as we say in English. That's the past. The question is, in your dealings with Brazil, do you perceive that Brazil is charting a different path going forward and one that possibly enhances the likelihood that the U.S.-Brazil can work together in this region on trade and investment issues um, uh, to, and, and possibly even in, in the multilateral setting, but certainly in, this, in the regional setting. Sure, that's, that's I think, a really important question. Um, I mean, at first I would say that the relationship with Brazil has evolved in recent years if nothing else, because Brazil itself has been uh, exerting a, a greater degree of confidence uh, in itself and its, in some future. And that, I think, has facilitated the dialogue uh, between our countries. In 2008, uh, Presidents Obama and Rousseff started uh, presidential-level dialogues. In reality, it's uh, one strategic dialogue, but under that uh, are uh, a couple dozen uh, dialogues on very specific issues led by different agencies of the U.S. government and our Brazilian counterparts. And those dialogues have been going very well. They're starting to get for the first time into very specific sort of nitty-gritty elements of our cooperation, ranging from science and technology to education uh, to infrastructure finance, which is the piece that Treasury leads. And I think the work of many in this room, including Ambassador Shannon, Dan Restrepo, and others, uh, we've been able to move that relationship forward. And remember, the relationship, the strategic dialogue between the U.S. and Brazil, is much younger and much newer than that between China and the U.S. And therefore, there's still a degree of getting to know one another, getting to learn one another's language, learning to understand one another's interests. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's part of it. Uh, I think at the same time, Brazil is beginning to uh, reassess its own relationships uh, in the world and in the hemisphere. Uh, for a long time, it seemed that uh, you know, that China was uh, really the most important relationship Brazil had. I think over time it's become clear, as I mentioned earlier, that the United States actually has, uh, there's more complementarities between the U.S. economy and the Brazilian economies, uh, and there's different things that the U.S. can offer, and I think that has really helped. And now as Brazil's uh, economic growth has slowed uh, rather quickly, I think there's increased, um, you know, uh, reflection in Brazil uh, as to what those things, where is that coming from? Is it cyclical? Is it structural? How can we help? And some of that is trickling into our bilateral dialogue. We're trying to learn from one another what we can uh, do better, not just um, uh, individually, but also together and with relations to the third parties in third countries. First of all, the, the, the issues that Jennifer raised, the non-traditional trade issues, uh, 
that are increasingly the, the, um, the, the points of contention in, in trade agreements. Uh, uh, in many ways, came up first in Europe. Um, uh, and some of these are things like genetically modified organisms or privacy issues, uh, certainly not issues that uh, the last generation dealt with when they were dealing with trade agreements. And there's obviously been great resistance by, by traditional trade people that these things be part of trade agreements, but I think the political reality is they are and they will be in the future. They'll be the uh, uh, huge issues in a US-EU free trade agreement, for example. Um, I'm curious as you, in many ways, Europeans are on the, on the cutting edge of these, of these uh, discussions with the public about them and how you overcome these issues and how we enable these issues to broaden the support for economic integration rather than become the barriers that actually stop into economic integration. I'd be curious to get your thoughts uh, how, how one handles these issues. Well, as you know, in uh, 96 in Singapore, uh, the EU uh, pushed very much uh, in favor of putting on the agenda of the WTO the so-called trade and issues, including investment, public procurement, competition, uh, trade facilitation. All of them were not uh, put on the agenda, with the exception of trade facilitation, due to the opposition of de developing countries. So one of the reasons why bilateralism and and, 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 uh, and the plurilateralism are gaining ground against uh, plurilateralism has to do with uh, the possibility of putting those issues on the table. And that's why most of the last generation free trade agreements of the European Union, they do include most of these mm -hmm. issues, investment, public procurement, services, competition, labor standards, uh, which was one of the Singapore issues, a failed one. So if you go to the new generation of trade agreements, uh, Korea, Canada, Colombia and Peru, uh, uh, Central America, all of them have what we call the sustainable development chapter, which includes environmental standards and core labor standards. So this is a something uh, which is an added value to the bilateral trade agreements and this is why they have a wide support in the European Union because according we are constitutional bound in the Union to uh, tie to link trade with other issues including human rights development and so, and so on and so forth and so we are very keen at the European Parliament in seeing to it that the European Commission, the executive, the negotiating power body of the Union does abide by those rules and I think that have been very uh, successful in, in, in uh, attaining those objectives. And let me tell you, commenting on one of the questions that were put forward, that the, the, the one of the failure, the most important reason for the failure of Doha was not a fight between developed and developing countries. It was the fight between developed and a new category of countries, which is the emerging countries. If you want to put a name, in it, it, is, it was between the United States and China, not between the United States or European Union and African countries. So this is, this, this is a new type of issue which emerged in the last two decades and which brought about, I, I wouldn't say the there, but at least the freezing of the, of the Haram. Great. Uh, let's go to the audience again. Questions? Here, in the back. Yeah, way in the back. Again, we'll take a couple of questions and then... Thank you very, thank you very much. Alfredo Valadao from Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, when we talk about trade, uh, we are fundamentally talking about commodities trade and intra-firm, intra-sector trade, which is the big thing. We all know that uh, the global production today is dominated by huge chains of uh, production chains of values uh, uh, fragmented all around the world. And we all know this study about uh, the iPod, where we see that in the end, uh, Apple, United States, gets 40% of the value added, China gets 4% of the value added, and the other goes to the component makers in Southeast Asia, Germany, or, or the United States. That's why uh, Pascal Lamy is making a call uh, to change a little bit the trade statistics, to put value added in. Uh, 
because and there's a lot of people who don't want that because it would be too much transparency so my question <laughs> my question is to uh, in a wider if we strengthen trade in the wider atlantic what would that mean for the specialization of each country and its sectors in this uh, who's going to get the value added and what would it mean uh, for f f uh, uh, the future trade negotiations in WTO, this kind of question. Uh, uh, what I want to say is who in the end will get what in Brazil we say with the French accent, the filet mignon of this uh, <laughs> trade. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Dan Hamilton from the Johns Hopkins Center for Transatlantic Relations. I think uh, the question for me is, what is distinctive about the ec Atlantic economic interactions uh, compared to others? And I think some elements have come out. I think Alfredo's comment is important in terms of, will, that, will these changes in innovation mean a relocation uh, of uh, inter-firm uh, production, maybe closer to home? So maybe a shift from some Pacific locations, Bruce indicated that earlier, to maybe the Atlantic. I think that's still a question that I'd like to see. But I think the other distinctive elements, services is really a very distinctive element for the Atlantic economies, if I may say. It is, uh, the major services economies are all in the Atlantic. Uh, and if one could open up the services economy, it seems to me there's a huge potential there, also because more jobs are actually in that economy in many areas. Investment is also a distinctively Atlantic phenomenon. We talk about good trade and goods and so on, but investment, as Bruce said earlier, drives a lot of the trade. And it would seem to me if you can open up the investment climate in many of these countries, uh, much could go forward. Germany, for instance, a classic trading company, uh, country, German investments in Brazil are multiple times German trade with Brazil. Uh, German companies would prefer to go to Brazil, right, not just send things to it. And is there an opportunity there? And I think uh, formulating that in question, particularly how does this relate to Africa? How can Africa, given these dynamics, and also the energy dynamic, which is also the other distinctive thing, really step into this Atlantic space? I think the question for, uh, for Africa into this dialogue is how does it step into this Atlantic uh, economic space in ways that could really uh, take off? Great question, and I would highly recommend uh, Dan's yes, annual yes. publication on U.S.-EU trade is, is the kind of Bible of statistics on all of this. Uh, briefly, we, because we have to close, uh, let, me, let me kind of, if you can make them quick, we'll, we'll try to do all of these. Back here. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Dr. Kaba Saran Daraba. I'm the Secretary General of Mano River Union, which is an intergovernmental organization comprising Côte d'Ivoire, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. I have two questions. One, I have heard a lot about economy since yesterday in the transatlantic dialogue. What it is about culture. I think that the Atlantic Ocean is very important for us, especially for the region I'm privileged to lead now because we have 2,040 kilometers cost on the ocean and it is about 50 million people living from there. The second question is, what role we can see the diaspora, the African diaspora, living in the northern countries? What kind of role they can play when we know that they are giving more money to Africa than the public aid? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tolentino from Cape Verde. Uh, I try to link what Bruce has uh, said about uh, Brazil and uh, Atlantic Africa on one side and what uh, Vital Moreira uh, has said about a missing side in this quadrilata. Uh, would you wish to elaborate a little bit on this, on how you, you see 
this uh, filling this gap uh, from the European Union vision. Thank you. And these two, but really quickly, yeah, right here, yeah. And, and. Thank you, Carlos Portales from Chile in American University today. Just a quick question, how do you evaluate the, the main international trade negotiation of today, which is the Trans-Pacific uh, Economic Partnership in terms of these Atlantic corridors? Yeah, um, my name's Lyle White, I'm from South Africa. Just a, a very quick note about um, the hype around Africa. Um, and I'm not dampening the whole subject, and, but I think we have to put this in, into context and be realistic. Uh, one Africa does not exist, it is far from integrated. Interregional trade is not 25% of total trade in Africa, it's a mere 10 to 12%. Um, and if we don't work on this, we won't ever integrate Africa into the Atlantic. And, and finally, in terms of, of Africa, Latin America, or Africa, Brazil, uh, economic context, context the economic reality is getting in the way because these are two regions that, that produce or export commodities principally. Africa's exports are still predominantly commodities. So the economic realities and uh, there's no uh, complementarity in trade between these. So there's very little hook to actually bring this on board. Briefly, uh, what we'd like to do is have folks uh, pick and choose a question you want to answer based on the ones that have been uh, asked. and. Consider this also your concluding remarks. Try to keep it short. Maybe the first one that we can group together here is really these remarks about the changing nature of modern economies, the imp growing importance of value added, um, what Dan was hitting at, that we may actually potentially see production return to North America and even Europe. Uh, which then would probably make it harder for Africa to get itself into this game because um, uh, breaking out of this commodity uh, exporter role may prove more, more difficult. Uh, anybody want to uh, address that question? I Andrew. Well, let, let, let me say first that um, uh, global supply chains today uh, are very much a reality, an evolving one and I continue to be, it, it has its own risks. Uh, we've seen it with Fukushima, with Luzon, Thailand, etc. 50% of world trade, and increasingly so, is made up of intermediate goods, and now a big exaggeration. In Latin America and Africa, with some exceptions, are virtually excluded from the global supply chains. Mexico is highly integrated in North America. Costa Rica has done big transformations, so they are also integrated, and in some sectors mainly in Brazil, aircraft, and a few others. But the rest, nothing. Maybe it's the curse of producing, being highly efficient to produce commodities. But things may be changing in terms of the quality of the investment. Now, why is this a case? Maybe it's infrastructure, geographical proximity, business environment, etc. But what I am convinced of is that all this reality will necessarily require more and better rules and disciplines in the future. And maybe that helps to explain part of what the TPP is today, because it's also going into new uh, ambits of uh, regulatory frameworks. And to reply to, to Alfredo, who gets the filet mignon, in the final analysis, I think it's the ones who do the innovation, the ones who do the research, I think they are the ones, that, so the investment on education, I think, in improving skills is key to take part of the global supply chains and to get the filet mignon at the end of the day. I'm, I'm curious, Leonardo, uh, TPP was raised. We, we haven't really talked about that. It's not part of the Atlantic War. On the other hand, there are Western Hemisphere nations, including the US, Mexico, Canada, Chile, others who are involved in TPP. Um, how do you see TPP relating to what's happening in the, in, in the Atlantic corridor uh, going forward? I think TPP is a, is a really important, it's a really important development. The idea with TPP is to have really a gold standard trade agreement uh, that is going to 
allow us to enter into negotiations on issues that have not been touched before, that are complex, for example, uh, internet commerce, uh, that help at the same time have in place gold standard protections uh, on labor standards, environmental standards, uh, IPR, and uh, having countries from the Western Hemisphere uh, be part of that. Countries which, by the way, have a strong commitment to free trade, which in many cases themselves have FTAs with one another, uh, will be really important. Uh, it's great to be able to have both Canada and Mexico join the, uh, the uh, negotiations, and uh, I think it'll take, it'll take a long time to get them done, uh, but I think it's uh, really one of the most important developments we have. I'd say in closing, though, that you know, free trade is something that can be reversed, unfortunately. Open markets are not a guarantee that should be taken for granted. Uh, and that commitment has to be protected. And to protect free trade, uh, I think you have to prove that it works for most people, not just for a, a few, and that it leads to broad-based growth. And, and because of that, I think it's important at the same time that we invest uh, in ourselves, in our people, in order to make sure that we're all taking advantage of the trade agreements that are in place. We can sign more free trade agreements, uh, regional, bilateral, multilateral, but what's important then is to be able to take advantage of those agreements uh, once we sign them. And that means uh, in improving our own uh, quality of education. That's why uh, in the US there's so much concern now and so much focus on, on STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, uh, science, uh, math, uh, so much concern about improving our infrastructure, improving our capacity to innovate. Uh, and I think that applies to all of us who are part of this uh, trading system. Uh, you're the only elected leader on this panel. Uh, you have to go before the voters periodically. Uh, there was not a lot of protectionism in the wake of the uh, Great Recession, but Europe's about to go into another recession. Uh, how do we avoid those who depend upon Europe uh, as a driver of, of, uh, the, of the region's growth, of the corridor's growth? Uh, how do, are, are you worried about rising protectionism in, in Europe? Uh, based on these projections of new recession? Oh, well, definitely, we are, we are concerned about protectionism, not only the tendencies on the European side, but uh, also on the other side. You see, we very much concern the situation in South America, in, in Argentina, and even in, uh, in Brazil. So definitely, yes. I think that this crisis was, um, was less uh, Prejudicial regarding protectionism, and this is due to the WTO. And let me pay a tribute yeah. to this you think important leg of the WTO. Uh, secondly, uh, I think that uh, um, uh, protectionism is, 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 in the end, is prejudicial to those who adopt protectionist uh, measures. Allow me, uh, however, to, to comment on something that was, is very, uh, to my heart. Briefly, because we have to close. I'm, I'm okay. getting the signal to close okay. here. What is distinct, distinctive in Atlantic relations? I would say that uh, uh, proximity, history, culture matters. We are much more homogeneous uh, Atlantic than Pacific. And I wonder why we should be thinking on a TPP, on a whole Pacific approach, and when we speak of a transatlantic relationship, we think between the EU and the US. However, the homogeneity regarding history, values, languages, we share languages, we share religions, we share history, we share culture. So why shouldn't we try to profit from what we share in order to create a real transatlantic, wider transatlantic Great. marketplace? Jean-Michel, the final word. Any, any final comments you, you want to add? Comments? One about the, the, the very nature of, of African growth. African growth is not going to look like the Chinese growth. When China started its absolutely astounding growth process, it was already uh, entering into a demographic decline. And it chose the right uh, economic strategy, which is exports. Africa is and is going to be a huge a story of a huge demographic rise in the coming 30, 40 years. As a consequence, its economic strategy should be about building its own domestic market, and it's why it's very unlikely that Africa will become a large manufacturing exporter, because it has more to do within, so its economic history will probably more look like India's than yeah. China's.
Now, finally, uh, I think what we are discussing is of utmost importance. Uh, one way of looking at the economic future of Africa and the set of ties that it's building is by saying that uh, in you know, 20 years' time or 15 years' time, Senegal will belong to APEC. Uh, because this is how uh, uh, exports, uh, the African exports have moved, and it's how influence has moved. Now, the Atlantic has also a lot of things to share each other, cultural issues, in people issues. There were questions about diaspora. Diaspora is playing a right. huge role in all this context. For instance, we are now invested in about 60 corporations in Africa. About 20 of them are run by uh, returning people from the, from the European or the U.S. diaspora. So we, we really have to build this not as a com competitive or, uh, I mean, a, a hostile uh, attempt to, uh, I mean, to, uh, to push uh, APEC or Asia out of Africa, but as something that is complementary and that really balances the identities and the needs of the people. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our panelists and, and thank the audience for uh, great questions. And thank you, Bruce. That was terrific. If you're part of the Young Leaders meeting, you need to get over to your next meeting right away. Someone's waiting to speak to you at noon. The rest of you go out and grab a quick uh, cup of coffee, and we're going to come back and try to get back on track so you can go and have your terrific lunch here in Rabat. Thank you. Thank you.